Okay, this is um, meeting number three. And um, I want to continue with Rav Kook and Orota Chuva. I'm only going to do until chapter four. And we did chapter one. In chapter one, you had three levels, which were four levels. You remember there was Hachuva Hativit, natural penitence. Natural penitence included um, two levels. One level was treating your body correctly, which would never occur to us that it has to do with chuva. <laughs> but for Rav Kook, chuva is an all-encompassing concept. When it says in the Midrash that God created chuva before the world was created, for Rav Kook, it's not, it, I mean, it's true, it's chuva for human beings, but it's not just related to the idea of keeping a mitzvah. Tshuva is from the word to return, and for him it means to return to who you are and what you are. So you can return on different levels. So sometimes we sin against our body. We eat junk food. We eat a lot of sugar. Um, we go out without a coat. So the things that we do, and this is an important paradigm, because when we get punished, it's not an act of punishment, it's an, a direct um, um, it's a, a direct effect of our actions. Right? The fact that we ate junk food, we got a stomach ache because we're eating improperly all the time, we get sick. Because we're abusing our bodies, we get sick. So it's a direct result of my actions. I've always said, when you talk about reward and punishment in the Torah, God has no need to punish us. But we have to understand that the concept of punishment is a direct result of our action. That's what the idea is. There's certain things that we have to build ourselves up as a human being. And if that doesn't work, um, we have to get there anyhow sometimes. The Jewish people has to get to a certain point in history. If that doesn't work, they have to be helped because they have to get to that point. Uh, Ram Kha, Moshe Chaim Lutato, says that if it just had to, if it was just based on human nature, there never would be a redemption. Because there are always going to be righteous and evil people in the world. It's sort of like Mazan Ema. There, there's like a balance. There's always righteous and always evil people. Sometimes they're more evil, sometimes more righteous, but it goes back and forth. So theoretically, there never should be a redemption. There's no reason why the, the world should be improving and going to any place where it would be um, in a better place than it is today. It says, but only because God pushes behind the scenes does that actually get there. For Ramchal, there's even a structure of history through which God pushes the scenes. And Rav, and Rav Kook totally adopts this idea of the structure of history. That's why he calls it um, historia with a tav. Historia is Seter Yah. God is hiding in history. And a human being has to find God who is hiding in history. As it says, um, Yeshayahu says, Achenata el Mistater, Elohe Israel Moshiach. Definitely you are a God who hides. The God of Israel saves. So God hides and we look. It's a hide and seek sort of uh, relationship. There's a famous story about a Hasidic Rebbe on um, Erev Yom Kippur. He's walking towards the Beit Knesset and never gets there. And the Hasidim are waiting, waiting. <laughs> How long can you wait even for Hasidim? The Rebbe didn't show up. What's going on? So they start looking for him and they see him sitting down on the sidewalk and he's Shalom uh, Philip. Huh. So the, they're sitting on, he's sitting on the sidewalk and he's crying, and next to him, a little boy is crying also. And the Hasidim say, what's going on here? So the, the, the Hasidic Rebbe says, look, I was walking to Shul, I saw this little boy crying. I said to him, why are you crying? He said, well, we were playing hide and seek, and I went to hide, but nobody came to look for me. <laughs> so <laughs> I feel terrible, that's why I'm crying. And then the Rebbe started to cry, he says, that's exactly the point. God is hiding. He wants us to seek, a, to seek him, but we don't. 
<laughs> so that's a reason to cry. <laughs> so both of them were crying on the sidewalk. So anyhow, <clears throat> so the paradigm of chapter one of the four types of three types of chuva, which are really four, is as I said, physical chuva. You know, if we if we mistreat the body, it mistreats us. It's not a, it's not that the body is punishing us. It's a direct cause of our actions. So the same thing, also morality. When we act as, as in a wrong way, a lot of the way we act is going to reflect on other people and they're not gonna like us. That's a direct cause of the way we act. If we have a short temper, if we mistreat people, they're not gonna like us. So we're being punished for the way we're acting to them. So also this Musar Klayot, which he calls the guilty conscience, is a thermometer to point out we need to get the the uh, the sense of guilt. It's a thermometer to point out when we are morally abusive to others. But um, we don't have to dwell on it. If if Freud was right on one thing, it's that like it says in the Tanya, mortar, that a person doesn't have to dwell in sadness because uh, right the Bavitcher Rebbe explains mortar. From the word miutar, that too much sadness is not advantageous, it's superfluous. So you're not supposed to dwell in sadness. You're supposed to use the guilty conscience to, to fix, to mend, and then continue, not to keep dwelling on it all, all the time. So those are the, the two levels of natural, shalom, shalom, of natural um, teshuva. Level number one is Treating the body correctly. Number one, number two, is the moral consciousness, conscience, which is part of the natural body. It's part of our faculty of reason, according to Kant. Uh, the only difference is that instead of being based on logic, it comes before logic. It is a priori. But for Kant, um, the morality is based on reason, but not reason of regular logic. You can't prove it but you know it's correct. We all know that you're not supposed to steal, as I said. But try proving to somebody why you can't steal, it becomes very difficult because you have to lower the idea from its level <laughs> to a very mundane level, what we call Musar Ganavim, the ethics of thieves, that they don't want to steal from each other because they, if you steal against that guy, he's going to steal from you. But that's not what do not steal means. It means to respect the possessions of other people. It doesn't matter if they're going to steal from you or not, it you know, it's um, um it's it, that's not part of the equation. So um, so a priori knowledge means that I don't kill because I believe in the sanctity of life. It's not because they can kill me. Okay, so the logical proofs will only take away from the importance of the value. When you try to, that's the way moral values work. The more you try to prove them, the more you're taking away from them. Because they come before the proof. We understand them intuitively. That's why some people have problems with them. But that's the way they work. But the truth is, a lot of things in life are intuitive. It's the way, it's the way we are. You want to try to understand people? Logic is not going to work. It's all intuition. You know, when you see a good businessman... They can tell who the cheaters are right from the beginning and who the honest people are, who they can trust. It's like they pick it up after a while. So it's, um, it's, it's intuitive. They see certain clues and right away. So people is all intuitive and morality, which is dealing with people, is, of course, intuitive. So that's tshuva hativit. The second level was tshuva emunit, which is the way we usually understand tshuva, that I want to follow the Torah. If I broke a law in the Torah, I want to mend my ways. That's the way most people understand tshuva. And most of the early literature on tshuva, like the book Sharei Tshuva of Rabbeinu Yona, um, this is the way they depicted tshuva. But Rav Kook sees it as a much more encompassing concept. And then tshuva sikhlit means already making the Torah part of your Weltanshan, where it's part of the way you see life. So then... It's a different concept of tshuva. It's not a sense of guilt. It's the idea that I want to 
walk in the path that I now understand is good for me. That's a, a different concept of tshuva. That's like a metamorphosis where instead of feeling guilty, you become disappointed in yourself. Right? That's like the higher level of tshuva. You say, I'm not acting the way I should be acting. When you're not focusing on, you're not interested if God's going to punish you. That's not the issue. I want to be what I can be. That's the higher level of tshuva. You know, what we call tshuva mi ahava. Somebody does it because they care, because it means something to them. There are different levels of tshuva mi ahava. Um, in the Hasidut, they call tshuva mi ahava. Also goes together with fear. It's the fear of losing the love. But again, not fear of punishment. That's called tshuva mi ahava. <laughs> Okay, that was chapter one. I want to now go to chapter two, because two and three will also talk about individual tshuva, and then chapter four will talk about national and worldly tshuva. I will stop there in Orota tshuva, and, and then the time and in the next meeting, we will talk about how these ideas apply to Rav Kook's understanding of Jewish nationalism and the world redemption. Of course, we talked about a little bit of redemption, but let me open this right here. This is Orota Tshuva. It's upside down. It's right here. This is chapter two. So again, we're talking about individual Tshuva, but before we talked about it in the person in general, now he's talking about it in the sense of time. Chapter two is talking about time. Chapter three is talking about space. We'll see. So, sudden and gradual teshuva. Sudden gradual teshuva, we'll see, are, are different psychological relationships to teshuva. In terms of time, teshuva can be divided into two parts, sudden teshuva and gradual teshuva. Sudden teshuva comes about as a result of a certain spiritual flash that enters the soul. And once the person senses all the evil and the ugliness of sin. And is converted into a new being. Already experiences inside himself a complete transformation for the better. This form of penitence dawns upon a person through the grace of an inner spiritual force, which traces, whose traces point, whose traces point to the depths of the mysterious. There are some people that they have what I call a trauma. The trauma could be negative or positive. Negative could be somebody close to you passed away and now your life is topsy-turvy and you want, you're looking for meaning in life because it doesn't mean anything anymore. That's like an earthquake inside and you need answers and that pushes a person to do things that maybe we delayed for many years but now we want to know right now, what's going on? It could also be a positive trauma. A positive trauma is um, um, also a, a negative trauma. could also be a person was in an accident, a near-death experience, and then they say, you know, there must be meaning to my life, and they start thinking about the things that we don't like to think about more normally. A positive trauma is, let's say, for instance, person comes to Israel for the first time in their lives, they go to the Kotel, and all of a sudden, when they think about the history of the Jewish people, they become overwhelmed with a feeling of holiness that they never experienced before. And they want to understand what it is. What do they feel for that moment? Where does it come from? What does it mean? Does it have a meaning in their life? And they will start a journey, a spiritual search. I think I, I mentioned to this one time, but I don't remember if it was you or somebody else. Years ago, I think maybe I told you about this woman from England who wanted to convert. I didn't tell you the story. I don't know if it was this group or not. I have a few groups. I, uh, this woman came from England. Um, she had a brother who was studying in yeshiva who was Jewish and she was not. How does that happen? Because they had the same father, but not the same mother. 
So her brother, who was born from a second marriage, her father had mar married a Jewish woman, and her half-brother was studying in yeshiva in Tulsa. So she came to visit her brother, and she was interested in conversion because she saw that for him it was a big deal. So, um, so I remember meeting with her about this, and that was the time when um, you had in England Richard Dawkins' book, uh, trying to belittle religion. There was also this fellow Hitchens who had also written a book, I think called the the God Delusion or something like that. And um, I remember saying to her, here you are, you want to convert to Judaism, but in England, where you're coming from, you have two famous speakers who are constantly bashing religion. <laughs> How would you address them now that you're going in the opposite direction? She says to me, Richard Dawkins has no idea what it means to be on a spiritual journey. And I always saw that as a very significant <laughs> answer because that's really a lot what it is. When people are on a spiritual journey, the world looks different. It's not only about logic and trying to put the pieces together. <clears throat> so a person can have sudden penitence as a result of a certain spiritual flash. At once, the person senses that all evil and ugliness of sin is converted into a new being. They experience inside themselves a complete transformation. We have stories like that in the Talmud of people that happen to them. And we you probably know people like that. The danger, of course, of sudden teshuva is that what comes, what comes quickly can uh, leave quickly. And, um, you know, one day <clears throat> a person wants to be uh, Hasidic with payas, whatever, and then the other day they become exact opposite because sometimes it can just show instability that's why when things happen quickly it's not the greatest thing i remember years ago i met this kid in montreal at the shul my father was a rabbi and his parents were very concerned because the boy became religious at the age of 13 right after his bar mitzvah now, the parents were traditional they came to shul to synagogue but they weren't religious and the good boy wanted the house to be kosher and they wanted him to keep Shabbat and whatever. So they said, can you meet with our son? <laughs> I said, okay, I'll meet with him. So I met with the boy. I said, how are things going? He said, oh, we're doing, I'm working on the kosher, I'm working on Shabbat. I said to him, you know, you're not from a religious family. And I think that you're going a little too fast. Why don't you take these things gradually? First work on keeping kosher, in the house, out the house. And then when you have that under your belt, then try taking aspects of Shabbat. First you come to Shul, then you may light the candles maybe before Shabbat, then you'll start keeping things of Shabbat if you can, but do it slowly. He looked at me, he says, I talked to a whole bunch of people, you're the first one who said to me I should take it slowly. <laughs> Everybody else said, fantastic, whatever. Anyhow, six months later, I spoke to his mother. He did not follow my advice. He tried to take the whole thing in one shot. Six months later, he was back to square one. He wasn't religious anymore. Because that's what happens. It, it's not, it can't be a fad. It has to be part of your life, and it takes time for something to be part of your life. So one of the dangers of sudden teshuva is that the way it came, it could go. So Rav, Rav Cook says, there's also a second type, which is a gradual form of penitence, of teshuva. It's not a sudden flash of illumination, which dawns upon a person to make them change from the depths of evil to the depths of good, the heights of good. But he feels that he must mend his way of life, his will, his pattern of thought. By the way, he says will before pattern of thought because in Kabbalah, the will, the ratzon, is a higher level than the chokhmah, which is wisdom. So he mends his way first by the will, which controls everything, and then the pattern of thought. By heeding this impulse, he gradually acquires the ways of balance, of equity, inner balance. He corrects his moral virtues. 
He improves his actions. He conditions himself increasingly to become a good person until he reaches a high level of purity and perfection. So in other words, he works on himself little by little. He works on his will. Like I always say to people who want to convert to Judaism, the hardest question that you're going to ever be asked by the Beit Din is how serious you are about this process. <laughs> That's the hardest question to answer. Not if this name in the Bible, that name in the Bible, um, how do you keep Shabbat? It's about your seriousness and your commitment. If that you have set, then everything else will be simple. So, um, so this happens slowly and gradually. There will the way of thinking, because it's a different way of thinking. And then, of course, to correct your morality, because the Torah is about the level of what's called natural morality and Kedusha, sanctified morality. There's things that people are not used to if they're not brought up in Judaism. Becoming a good person, which is the cornerstone of becoming religious, because if you're not a good person, you'll never understand spirituality. Derech Eretz Kadmala Torah. If a person doesn't understand why they have to be a good person, they'll never understand Kedusha. Until they reach a high level of purity and perfection. So that is Hadragatit, gradual Shuva, which is more stable. There's more of a chance that the person will remain with this. Higher expression of penitence of Teshuva comes about as a result a flash of illumination of the all good, the divine, the light of him who abides in the eternity. So in other words, this expression of teshuva is also a flash of illumination, but it's, I, I deal with it differently. I don't push myself to the other side so quickly. I work on myself. I work on my will. I work on my thoughts. I work on my actions, on my understanding of morality, all at the same time. Universe, okay, so the universal soul, the spiritual essence is revealed to us in all its majesty and holiness, to the extent that the human art can absorb. Indeed, it is not all of existence, that all of existence is so good and so noble, and is not the good and the nobility in ourselves, but an expression of our, one moment, relatedness to all. How then can we allow ourselves to become severed from everything? A strange fragment patched from like tiny grains of sand that have no value? The result of this perception it is truly a divinely inspired perception comes penitence out of love in the life of the individual and in the life of society. So, Rav Cook adds here that what really happens when I do gradual teshuva? I start realizing that I am part of the world that God created, and I have a place in this world, and I have a function in this world and a task. Therefore, I see myself as a greater scheme, as a large plan, and I want to be part of the plan and, and play my role. This gives also meaning to my life when I see it as such. That is chapter two. Shalot, still. Two types of tshuva. One is called spontaneous or very quick. And then there is gradual, the shuva. As I said, spontaneous, the downside, what comes, goes. The gradual is much more secure and there's more of a chance that it will remain. But both can happen. A person can have actually spontaneous teshuva, then have a slump, but then build themselves up gradually. That's also possible. Meaning just two parts. First part being spontaneous, and then building it up gradually. It doesn't necessarily mean they have to leave. That happens a lot. By the way, according to the Ari, that's exactly the meaning of the just the positioning of Pesach before Shavuot. According to the Ari, the night of the Seder is called Lel Shimurim, when we are protected. Why is the night of the Seder we're protected? 
Because that's the night that God took us out of Egypt, out of his love, not because we deserved it. So it's like a tremendous amount of divine light coming into the world, where the Jews are pl plucked out of Egypt, even though that they had fallen to the 49 levels of impurity, according to the Midrash. But Kilolam Chastov, because of God's plan, and because of his promise to Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, he pulled us out of Egypt. So great light shines on that night, and it defends the Jews from everything, just like it did in ancient times, from the Malach Amavit, angel of death, from coming into our houses in Egypt. But after that night, by the way, that's why on the, that night we don't say Kriyat Shema. Alamita, I'm talking about. You don't have to say Kriyat Shema on, on the bed, because Kriyat Shema on the bed is to protect us. As we already said, Kriyat Shema in Mariv. But on that night, we don't have to. You can say the Shema if you want, but the rest of it you don't. Because that is Leil Shimurim, protected night. But then, um, the Ari writes, the next day, we have a slump. <laughs> we go back down to where we were. And in the 49 days of reciting the Omer, we're building ourselves up slowly. That is like gradual tshuva until we come to Shavuot. So that first night when God takes us out of Egypt, out of his mercy and kindness and love for us, that's called spontaneous teshuva, which actually didn't happen because of us. But during those 49 days, we have to build ourselves up with a gradual teshuva. So you have this concept also in the relationship between Pesach and Shavuot. I just want to read this next chapter. He calls particular tshuva and general tshuva, which I call looking at tshuva spatially, as if it's everywhere or in a specific spot. Um, you'll notice for a moment that these first three chapters relate to man, time, space. This idea of man, time, space is found in the book Sefer Yetzirah, the book of, uh, book of creation. Sefer Yetzirah says that all of, all of the world is split up into three, two, three things, which is called Olam, which is space, the world, Shana, the year, meaning time, and Nefesh, which is the human being. According to Sefer Yetzirah, that's three dimensions of, of life. You have consciousness, which is a human being, and you have time and space. But the truth is, time and space also relate to consciousness. But we're conscious of ourselves, and we're conscious of time and space. So Rav Kook, when he's talking about tshuva, he's breaking it down into these three dimensions, and most people who read the book don't realize that. The reason why he's doing it is because the original part of the book was these three chapters, and then the fourth was added. I think the fourth might have been in the beginning, but definitely the first three chapters are organic, organically related to each other. By the way, it's interesting uh, on Sefer Yitzhirah. Remember, space has already three dimensions. Einstein saw the idea of time as relating to space, almost like a fourth dimension. So according to Sefer Yitzhirah, if we see it in that sense, it's like there's a fifth dimension, which is called the conscious human being. The conscious human being who is observing time and space, we are the fifth dimension. So they have, have three dimensions in space and one dimension in time. Our involvement in space-time is our is the fifth dimension and how we see things. According to Sefer Yitzhira. But they're actually, there were there are people who discuss that even today, that the observer is part of the experiment in a sense. Okay, so getting back to this, chapter three. There is a form of teshuva that addresses itself to a particular sin. Or to many sins. There's two types of tshuva. There's one type of tshuva where we say, you know what? My biggest problem is I keep fighting with my sister. Okay, I have a sister in New York. We keep fighting about this, that. And I want to improve that. So I work on myself. I say, I'm going to control myself next time. 
And if I don't do it, I'll control myself the time after. <laughs> okay, that's called particular. Or somebody says, you know what? I'm smoking. It's damaging my health. I want to stop smoking. I'm going to work on this until I conquer it and get rid of it once and for all because I can't stand it. Okay? Or a person says, I keep getting angry at people and I have a, a quick fuse. I want to stop it. I want to not get angry at people. I'm going to work on it. Or somebody says, you know what? When it comes to kosher, uh, when I go eat out, I, I don't pay that much attention. At home, I'm very straight. But okay, I'm going to work on that. I, I guess it doesn't make sense. That's called particular teshuva. Where I'm focusing on something very specific, and therefore I want to conquer that specific thing. So that's called teshuva of a particular sin. What does that mean? To many particular sins. Or I also get angry and I also smoke and I also get, <laughs> there could be a whole bunch of things that I want to work on. And I even have a list. A person confronts his sin face to face, feels remorseful, but he fell into the trap of sin. Meaning, so remember, if there's no hakarat achet, if you cannot admit that you have a fault, you'll never change it. Right? The first step of Alcoholics Anonymous is to call yourself an alcoholic. Because every alcoholic thinks they're not an alcoholic. I have a bit of a drinking issue. It's not something controlling my life. Okay, You have to realize, yes, you're an alcoholic. Now work on it. There's um, a story told by um, Rabbi Dr. Abraham Tversky. <clears throat> he calls it understanding prayer <laughs> for some reason. So, um, but he tells a story about this fellow who came to his uh, rehabilitation clinic in, uh, I think it was in Detroit, or no, Pittsburgh, it was in Pittsburgh. He had a rehab clinic for alcoholics, for people on drugs, for... <clears throat> and uh, this one fellow comes, and of course, there are facilitators who work with him, like counselors. And the counselor comes to him and says, look, the first thing you have to do is you have to learn to pray. And I says, what do you mean? <laughs> you have to pray because you want to get out of this? <laughs> you have to learn to pray to a higher source. And I says, I'm an atheist. What do you, how am I supposed to pray? The counselor says to them, I don't care if you're an atheist. You have to pray or you're never going to get over this. And I says, that's weird. He says, do it. Okay. Six months later, um, so Rabbi Dr. Tversky bumps into this fellow, comes over to him and says, Dr. Tversky, I want you to know for the last month and a half, I'm dry. I don't drink anymore. I pray every day. Made me a different person. But I still don't believe in God. <laughs> However, the fact that I pray every day reminds me that I am not God. And that helps me. Sometimes by knowing our limitations, we realize that we have to overcome them. Okay, so a person focuses on something specific. They struggle with it until they're liberated from this sinful enslavement. They begin to experience a holy freedom is most delightful, this weary self. This healing continues like a ray of a benign sun. And divine mercy reaches out to him with a feeling of happiness grows within them. When we are able to overcome our shortcomings, our flaws, it's a feeling of empowerment. Ezehu gibor hakovesh et yitzro, Ben Zoma says, who is the real Strong man who can overcome their own evil inclination. Because it's no big deal if you fight somebody who's a weakling. Yeah, of course you can beat them. But it's difficult to fight somebody who is exactly has the same strength as you. A person who can overcome themselves means that I was able to overcome an enemy who has the same strength as me. Because I am myself. <laughs> So if I have a flaw, it means I have to overcome my own 
abilities. That means I have to learn to transcend myself. That's a very difficult thing to do. That's why the real Gibor is somebody who can overcome their own passions, their own flaws, because then I have to transcend myself. Do so. Ezeo Gibor, a Kovesh So that's a feeling of catharsis, a feeling of happiness, a feeling that I accomplished something. I really wanted to do this, and I did it. I wanted to lose weight for years. I'm 30 kilos over. I decided to pick myself up. I'm eating healthy. I go to the gym every day. I lost it. I took control of my life. Now I'm going to look for another mountain to conquer. That's the way life works. I used to get angry all the time. I was able to control this. People can't believe it. <laughs> they wonder if maybe I'm the brother of the other guy. <laughs> yeah, that's the way. So he feels this creates a feeling of happiness. His experience, he experiences this at the same time that his heart remains broken and his spirit bowed in with melancholy. Indeed, this lowly feeling itself suits him in this condition, adds to his spiritual satisfaction and a sense of true peace, which means, Lev Nishbar, the fact that I broke down and realized I had to change my life, I remember together with the happiness. Both of these things come from me. The fact that I was able to break my old self and rebuild my new self, the bitter and the sweet come together. He feels himself draw, drawing closer to the source of life, to the living God, who about a short time before was so remote from him. Nachman of Braslav says that when a person feels very distant from God, they should be happy. Because if you were really far away from God, you would not realize that you're far from God. The very fact that you feel that you're far from God means that there's still hope. So you're not as far as you think. Because if you would be really that far, it wouldn't concern you at all. The wistful spirit recalls with joyous relief its previous inner anguish. It's filled with a feeling of gratitude. Father always said gratitude is an important part of life. When we feel thankful, it makes us feel happy. Because then we realize we actually accomplished something. If we only think about the bad things in our life, it makes us depressed. Every now and then, by feeling thankful, we can also feel happy because we think about the things that we did accomplish. And they are there. We just don't think about the things we did. We always think about our failures and never our successes. And then it breaks into a hymn of thanksgiving. The cook does this a lot. He starts quoting verses. Kim, um, praise O God, my soul, forget not all your kindness. He forgives all your sins. He heals your afflictions. He rescues your life from the pit. He adorns you with grace and compassion. All this is from Tehillim. He sates you with every good. He renews your, your youth like, a, like an eagle. The Lord performs merciful acts. He vindicates the cause of the oppressed. How anguished was the soul. The burden of its sin. It was vulgar, frightfully oppressive. Depressed she was, meaning the soul. In the Hebrew, it's the shana keva. It's in the feminine. Even if outer riches and honor fell to her lot, what good is there in all the wealth of the inner content of life when, it, when the inner content of life is impoverished and dry? How blissful the soul feels now. And the inner feeling that sin has been forgiven, that the nearness of God is alive and shining in her. And her inner burden, meaning the soul's inner burden, has made lighter. She has already paid her debt. No longer oppressed by inner confusion and distress. Soul is at rest, filled with an innocent peace. Return to my peace, O oh my soul. The Lord has bestowed kindness on you. All that is called particular sin. I have something wrong, a flaw. I have many flaws. I'm working on them, though. One after another physical, moral, spiritual, I'm working on it. When I get to a point where I feel like I'm winning, 
that's a field where I'm, I'm happy because I accomplished something. Because the hardest thing to do is change yourself. Even changing other people is easier. They might be stronger than you. Besides, you might have thought you 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 changed them, but you just gave them good so good advice. It wasn't you? Hmm. However, there's another type of feeling of teshuva, unspecified, just general, not about anything specific. A person does not conjure up a memory memory of past sin or sins. Sometimes I can't think of anything specific, any particular flaw that I want to change. The person doesn't conjure any, men, any, any memory of a sin, but in general, they feel terribly oppressed, oppressed, feel themselves pervaded by sin, feel that the divine light is not shining within them. There's nothing noble about them. Feel that their heart is not sensitive. Moral behavior does not follow the right course for the of sustaining a meaningful life for a wholesome person. That the state of education is crude. Their emotions stirred by dark and sinister passions revolt them. They are ashamed of themselves. They know that God is not within them. And this is the greatest misfortune. The greatest oppressive sin. They feel embittered against themselves. They can find no escape from these oppressive thoughts, which do not focus on any particular deed. Their whole being is as though in a torture chamber. This state of spiritual malaise, Shuva comes as therapy, as if from a master physician. There's nothing in particular which they feel that it's not something specific. It's not that they get angry too much. It's not that they're mistreating people. It's not that they're not going to the Beit Knesset. It's not that they don't keep kosher. It's not, but they feel like it's not working. Their whole life isn't working. They're not becoming spiritual. They're not, they don't feel the connection to God. They're going through the motions. Nothing's happening. They still feel like an empty vessel. Like they're not coming to whatever they could come to as a human being. Feeling this type of feeling of penitence, an insight to its profound nature, its basis in the deepest levels of the soul, is the mysterious workings of nature. And all the dimensions of the Torah and our religious tradition come with its might and streams in our soul. It says there's something very unique about this general feeling of teshuva. Sense of assurance, the healing, the general renewal that penitence extends to all those who embrace it, stills in him a spirit of grace and acceptance. He senses the fulfillment of the verse will comfort you as a person who is comforted by his mother. So this type of person who decides to change their lives, not because of something in particular, but just a general feeling of emptiness, this will give them the power to recreate themselves. Day by day, inspired by this higher level of general teshuva, his feeling becomes more firm and clear or illuminated by reason or authenticated by the principles of Torah, his manner becomes increasingly brightened. His anger recedes. Kindly light shines upon him. He's filled with vigor. His eyes sparkle with the holy fire. His heart is bathed in the rivers of delight. Holiness and purity hover over him. His spirit is filled with endless love. His soul thirsts for God. This thirst nourishes him with the choices of foods. Sale of addition like marrow and fat. The Holy Spirit rings out like him like a bell, as it, that's what the Talmud says about Shimshon. And he has given the good news that all his transgressions, the known and unknown, have been erased. That he has been born anew with a new being from the whole world. The whole world, all the realms of being have been renewed with him. All things now join with the chorus song. The gladness of God fills all of creation. Great is Teshuva, says in the Talmud and Yoma as it brings healing to the world. And even one individual who repents is forgiven, and the whole world is forgiven with him. So this is another type of teshuva. It's not about something in particular, not even about a list of things that I have wrong that I want to change. I just feel like it's not working. 
I daven, and it doesn't do anything for me. I do the mitzvot, it doesn't make me a better person. There's some emptiness. I want my life to count. I want it to be in a relationship to God. I want it to touch holiness. I want to know what it is. And this is not happening. I want to work on it until I feel that I can become what I'm able to become. So it's not something specific, but the more I work on myself, the more I struggle, the more I can succeed to put these parts together. I'll tell you a story. Um, a Shavuot in Tel Aviv. We have, of course, every year we have a, a program that goes all night. And um, so Rabbi Constantine asked me to give a talk. First, I gave a talk from 12 to 1. Then I had another talk from 1 to 2. Okay, 1 to 2 was in Ivrit. It was um, on the writings of uh, Rabbi um, Prime Oshri, who has wrote about the Shailot and Shuvot, the questions he was asked in the Kovna Ghetto during the war. It's called Shailot and Shuvot in Imam Okay, after the class, this fellow comes over and he says, I have a question. I thought he wanted to ask me about Rabbi Oshie's writings. I said, okay, what's the question? I said, what is Judaism? <laughs> I said, oh, I see you have a quick one. <laughs> okay, so we sat on the stairs outside the shul. He's asking about Judaism. And I assumed he didn't know anything. So I told him in Judaism, we have different commandments. Ben Adam the Chavero, Ben Adam the Makom, between man and God, man and man. And himself, I quoted the Talmud in Baba Batra. But as I'm talking to him, I realize that some of the quotes I mentioned from the Talmud, he knows. So obviously he knows something. Attends some classes. So I, I keep going on because I don't really know. And I mentioned something else and he seems to know that. And then all of a sudden, he asked a question I answered before I'm able to answer the question. Like a rifle, machine gun, shoots another question at me, and then another question at me. I said, slow down. I can't answer the questions that quickly. If you want, I can take them one for one, but I mean, it's just too much. Okay. We sat there for about two hours on these steps of the show. During this time, I can't remember the fellow of the young man. He was about, based on his story, I would say he was around 40. And then he told me a story. He said he was born into a religious family. And he had gone to yeshiva. He was actually at the Punavich yeshiva. He spent a few years there. Look, I don't know the whole story. I just know what he told me. He said one day he was sitting in yeshiva and he realized, I don't get it. Like, I can study the Talmud. I like doing that. But I don't really know what it's all about. I don't have the whole picture. It's like, and so he went to rabbis to ask them this, ask them that. And he spoke to this guy and that guy, and they told him, refer him to this book and to that book. And uh, But it didn't uh, satisfy him. He didn't feel like he really had a, a strong, in general, the Haredi society is not good about these things. But whatever, he, he definitely sounded like he made a real attempt trying to figure these things out. He said to me, eventually he left the yeshiva because he didn't feel comfortable. He felt like he wasn't connected correctly. He said he, got, he went off to Europe. He lived there for a few years. He had a non-Jewish girlfriend. He came back to Israel. And uh, I don't know what he does. He says to me, you know, there's some, he says, I really love the yeshiva. I had great memories from there. So there's some evenings when it's late, I'll just walk into the yeshiva, I'll sit down on a bench, pull out a gemara, and just start to study, just to reminisce. So he says, I, li I liked it, I just didn't know how to pull the whole thing together. So I looked at the guy and I said to him, you know, you remind me of a guy who bought a luxury car from Ikea. So they sent them all the parts of the luxury car, but he has no idea how to put it together. <laughs> That's what happens when you get a luxury car from Ikea. 
They give you all the pieces, but they expect you to put it together. He says, you have a lot of, inf I said, you have a lot of information. Really? But you don't know how to put it together. And this is creating, a you know, a terrible feeling. Because this is what you want. You want to put it together and it's not working. I said some other things to him. Most of them I don't remember. But I just remember this one thing. So when we talk about teshuva, sometimes a person is feeling, going through the motions, but they feel like it's not happening. <laughs> if I'm living my life as a religious Jew, why am I not feeling this metamorphosis, this progress within myself? What am I doing wrong? Why am I not advancing? It's true. Remember one time I had this group of 16-year-old young people from the United States. We were going to the cartel through the Jewish agency. And after we went to the cartel, this kid comes over and he says, no. I said, what? He says, everybody told me the cartel would be the greatest experience of my life. He says, it was just a wall. Nothing happened. I said, well, you have to prepare yourself. What does that mean? So said, look, let's say somebody gives you a transistor radio. Yeah? If you don't turn it on, it doesn't work, right? I said, let me give you another example. Let's say somebody says to you, I'm inviting you to a party. Okay. And this guy says, this is going to be the best party. The best food, the best DJ. Wonderful people. Like this, I'm telling you, it's going to be the best party. This is the party of the year. And you are invited. Thank you, thank you. Anyhow, the day of the party, had a fight with his parents, had a fight with his spouse, <laughs> or let's say it was a single person, fight of, of, uh, fight with her friend. And uh, they come to the party, but you know, they're in a little cloud hovering over their head in depression. So they come to the party. They sit down, eat something, look at the people, focused in their own world, and then they go home. Somebody says to them, okay, Joe, what did you think of the party? A party, you know, I've been to many parties. What? Everybody told me that was like the most outstanding part of the year, and you say it was nothing? I didn't notice. He says, that's the problem. If you walk in and you're depressed, the greatest party is not going to make any impression on you. You have to prepare yourself. You have to open yourself up towards the experience. We have a soul. That's like the antenna of the transistor radio. But if that soul is off <laughs> and you didn't prepare yourself to open yourself out to the possibility of an experience, it's never going to happen. You can go to a thousand times to the cartel, but you got to prepare yourself. That's the way it is in life. That's the way it is with spiritual connections. You have to be open to the possibility. You have to have your, your gli, your um, sensors on. And see if there's something there. And only th that way can you develop yourself. So these three chapters are of Cook talking about teshuva on the individual level, human soul or consciousness, time, space. And each one of them has an interesting insight. And then chapter four, he moves into a new realm, which is called national and worldly teshuva which will take us on a different course. In the meantime, I wish everybody Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. And, um, yeah. Are we meeting next Sunday or the Sunday after? It's up to you. Next Sunday is Cholamoy. Up to you. I'm fine with that. Chag yeah. Sameach. Thank you. Okay. Whatever, Philippe, what you whatever you want, Rafi. It's up to you. What, what do you think? Yeah. It doesn't matter to me. For me, it's, it's both. Uh, some people are busy in Cholamoy. They're on a trip or whatever, you know happens. Filippo, do you have any any thoughts? Uh, I think you're on mute. 